Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Hutchison. I'm the professor and department chair of the political science department here at URI. I want to uh, thank all of you for coming out tonight. On behalf of URI, the College of Arts and Sciences and the Department of Political Science, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Fall 2023 Langevin Symposium Series. This evening's event is titled Polarization of Politics in America, Finding the Center. So before we kick things off, I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement statement. The University of Rhode Island occupies the traditional stomping ground of the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. We honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the indigenous people and this land by teaching and learning more about their history and present day communities and by becoming stewards of the land we too inhabit. Now, a couple of announcements here before we really kick things off. First, we have a large crowd here, so thank you all. This is great, uh, great turnout. Um, I do want to remind everybody, in case there is uh, an emergency, we have exits here in the back in the lobby right behind you. Um, we also have exits on four side doors right here. Um, we would also ask at the end of tonight's uh, event if we could exit out the side exits. Um, there is another event that will be happening um, after this event uh, tonight, so if we could exit uh, in the side, that would be greatly appreciated. So as you can guess from the title, the symposium addresses a critical issue um, for both our country and throughout the world. That's political polarization. Political polarization is emerging as one of the largest threats to American democracy, having profound negative effects on our government, our culture, and even our national security. So as we approach yet another divisive national election season, I think it is more important than ever that we find ways to engage across the political divide. And the hope for this symposium is that we can model bipartisanship behavior and take a small step towards reducing polarization. Tonight, we are joined by a very esteemed panel. I would like to introduce, uh, <laughs> would like to introduce starting with the host uh, of tonight's event, James Langevin. Uh, Congressman Langevin served as a member of Congress from 2001 to 2023, representing Rhode Island's 2nd Congressional District, a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee and an expert on national and cybersecurity policy. He helped shape the focus of the Department of Defense, paving the way for heightened emphasis in harnessing technologies. We're also joined by Steve Israel, who served in the U.S. Congress representing New York's 2nd and 3rd Districts from 2001 to 2017. He also served four years as chair of the Democratic Congressional Com Campaign Committee. In addition to becoming an owner of a small independent bookstore, he now directs the nonpartisan Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at the Jeb S. Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell. He was also recently appointed by President Biden to the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities. And finally, we have Ryan Priebus. Mr. Priebus currently serves as the president of the Michael Best and Friedrich uh, National Nationwide Law Firm. Prior to joining Michael Best, he served as the White House Chief of Staff to President Donald Trump in 2017. Before that, he served as the longest serving chair of the Republican National Committee in modern history. He saw a dramatic turnaround the RNC, rescuing its finances and repairing its operations. And prior to that, he served as a longtime uh, uh, chair of the Republican National Committee in my home state of Wisconsin. He is currently an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve and serves as the chair of the Milwaukee Host Committee for the 2024 Republican National Convention. So as we begin, before I hand it off to Congressman Langevin, I would encourage you all also here tonight, if you're interested, to also attend the Honors Colloquium event that will be held right here in Edwards Hall at 7 p.m. It'll be a great panel discussion tackling uh, gender inequality featuring speakers Helena Akaji and Lauren Gray. All are welcome to attend. And with that, I turn over the floor to Congressman Langevin. Very good. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much for the, the kind introductions, and um, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. I especially want to recognize and, and welcome our special guests here uh, this evening. I know we're going to have a, a, a great uh, discussion uh, about politics and the passion that we share for politics and about the, the, the concerns and challenges that we see with the political divide that's happening in America. Uh, but uh, also we want to talk about you know, how do we find the, cent find the center. 
Um, before I, I, I begin in saying a few other words, I just want to acknowledge uh, some very special people in the audience, and, uh, and especially those who are very supportive uh, of making this series happen. We could not have done it without the great support uh, of the, uh, the president of the University of Rhode Island, uh, President Marc Parange. President Parange, thank you very much. I hope you give the president a round of applause for, for his work here. <laughs> I really thank President Parlange for his extraordinary leadership of, of URI and, uh, and of all the things he's doing to lead URI forward. I also want to recognize and thank uh, uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Science, uh, Jen Riley. Dean Riley, thank you very much. Uh, also, Chair of the Department of Political Science, we just heard from, Mark Hutchinson. Uh, I want to recognize uh, URI Foundation uh, and Alumni Engagement President, uh, Lil O'Rourke, uh, as well as uh, uh, the chairman of the URI Foundation, Al Varecchia, who I believe is in the audience as well. And I know we also have uh, several members of the Board of Trustees here uh, this evening. And uh, finally, I want to also acknowledge uh, my uh, uh, friend and uh, uh, colleague in government, uh, the former congressman uh, who held the seat before I did, uh, Bob Wagan, who is here this evening. If we give everyone a round of applause. Uh, earlier today, we had a uh, discussion. It was a state, state panel, and uh, we had um, uh, the chairman uh, of the uh, Democratic Party, uh, Joe McMarrow, also who's a state rep in, in Rhode Island from Warwick. Uh, we also had the, uh, the chairman of the Republican Party, uh, Joe Powers, uh, House uh, Minority Leader Mike Chippendale, and uh, also uh, Representative <coughs> Kathy Fogarty, uh, who uh, represents uh, the University of Rhode Island. And we talked about the, you know, the uh, political divisions, political divide in, in politics, uh, and it, you know, is it all uh, partisan? And that, is that all that's going on? The answer is clearly no. Uh, there's a lot of good things and a lot of centrist things that happen. Uh, it just seems that the extremes get the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, all the attention the, these days. And uh, tonight we're going to talk more the, about, the, about the federal level and uh, the, the rise of political divide. And you know, we see. It's because on, on both sides, you see the, you know, the, the far left and the, it was the Occupy Wall Street movement, I think, that kicked off the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the rise of the, the uh, extreme on the left and on the right, uh, the, 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 um, the rise of the Tea Party and the Freedom Caucus and, and such. Um, but I can tell you that th there is much more in terms of uh, uh, bipartisanship than, than, than meets the eye. And uh, it's not all about uh, just the far left and the far right. It really is the... Uh, the center that moves things forward. And I've always believed that it's the, uh, it's the, it's the, uh, the center and coming together in a bipartisan way that allows the big things to get done, and we see it time and time again. But to kind of frame the uh, discussion tonight, I, I thought I'd read some, some excerpts uh, from a book uh, that I'm, I'm really um, uh, appreciative of, uh, and it's uh, written by uh, Ari Hochschild, and the, 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 the title of the book is Strangers in Their Own Land. And she's a, um, uh, a social scientist, a professor at, uh, at Berkeley, and uh, definitely would be on the, um, um, uh, the liberal, more liberal end of the spectrum. But she really wanted to understand the, the, uh, the political divide in America and, and, and why we were getting so polarized. And so she spent five years uh, living in Louisiana, deep, deep red uh, state, and, um, and to try to understand the other side. And I think that's one of the things that is missing in politics sometimes these days when people are talking, talking at each other as opposed to speaking with each other and, and hearing the other side and, and uh, having empathy. So I'll just read a few things and I hope it helps to maybe frame our discussion uh, here tonight. So she said, I, I, you might say I had come to uh, Louisiana with an interest in walls, not visible physical walls such as those separating Catholics from Protestants in Belfast. Americans from uh, Mexicans on the Texas border, or uh, uh, once residents of East and uh, West Berlin. It was empathy walls that interested me. An empathy wall uh, is an obstacle uh, to deep understanding of another person, one that can make us uh, feel different or even hostile to those who hold uh, different beliefs or whose uh, childhood is rooted in uh, different circumstances. In a period of political tumult, we grasp uh, for quick certainties. We shoehorn new information into ways we already think. We settle for knowing our opposite numbers from the outside. But is it possible, without changing our beliefs, 
to know others from the inside, to see reality through their eyes, to understand the links between life, feeling, uh, and politics, that is to cross the empathy wall. So, um, and with, As the political divide widens and, uh, uh, and opinions harden, the stakes have grown uh, vastly higher. <coughs> Neither uh, ordinary citizen nor leaders uh, are, are talking uh, much across the aisle, damaging the surprisingly delicate process of governance itself. The United States has been, of course, divided before. Uh, during the Civil War, a difference in beliefs uh, led to some 750,000 deaths during the stormy 1960s, too, clashes arose uh, in the Vietnam War, civil rights and, uh, and women's rights. But in the end, a healthy democracy depends on the collective <coughs> capacity to hash things out. And to get there, we need to figure out what's going on. So with that, I want to turn to our, our panelists tonight. And again, thank you both for coming. Uh, one of my great claims to fame is uh, that I was Steve Israel's co uh, colleague. Uh, and for a classmate, uh, we came into, uh, into Congress together. So we've known each other for, for quite a few years, and I was thrilled that I could reach out to him. Uh, he leads the Institute of Politics at Cornell right now, but I was glad that we could, I could reach out and say, Steve, uh, you know, could we do this, uh, this series and uh, talk about um, you know, the divisions in America and again, how we get back to the center? So I'll, I'll put it to, to both of you uh, to give you perspectives. How do we get here, and how do we fix this thing? Steve, let me start with you. Well, Jim, thank you. And uh, uh, Jim and I were elected together uh, in 2000, served together on the Armed Services Committee. He, he told you that we came in together. He didn't tell you how we left. In rare form, in triumphant form, we left unindicted and undefeated, which is <laughs> Charlie Robinson in Congress. And uh, I, I also want to say, um, despite the, the very grim news and, and the anxiety and the tension that we all feel about the condition of the world, um, I hope you're going to see something different uh, tonight. I, I know you're going to see something different. A, uh, a stalwart Republican who chaired the Republican National Committee, uh, a stalwart Democrat who chaired the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee actually agreeing on things and, or disagreeing respectfully, which I think this country needs so much more of. I mean, if you want a symbol of how we get back to dialogue. Um, Reince Priebus and I just spent an hour at the Dunkin' Donuts just <laughs> off campus having coffee, talking about uh, th these issues. So very, very briefly, because I want to make sure that Reince uh, has, uh, has the time. Um, I think when the history is written, to your question, how did we get into this? When the history is written, and it may take some time for that history to be written, the books will deal with several events that fundamentally changed America's psyche uh, and its soul. The first was 9-11, uh, which I think fundamentally changed American perceptions of, uh, on institutions, changed America's confidence that we could live comfortably and safely and securely on this continent, separated by two oceans, and not have to worry about attacks in our country. Uh, and then the second thing was the, the Great Recession of 2008, which further rattled the American people's perceptions. You couldn't, you can't trust Wall Street anymore, you can't trust banks, you can't trust anybody. It's what led to two phenomenon in politics, the rise of the Tea Party on the right and the rise of Bernie Sanders on the left. Uh, Donald Trump, and I've heard Ryan's talk about this, if you, the 2016 election was a referendum on institutions and Donald Trump had the the longest middle finger of any no, to, to, those, to those institutions. Finger, yeah. um, and um, add to that social media and the instant acceleration and amplification of feelings which were driven mostly by algorithm and add the tribalization of cable television Reince does Fox News frequently, I do MSNBC. It's like we're talking to two separate planets because of the new business model of cable television. 
Uh, add those ingredients into it, and you have a very toxic mix. So by the way, congressional gerrymandering, which I hope we'll talk about, uh, which now has uh, a, Congress is either f deep blue or ruby red. There are very few districts that are purple. Put that all together, and you know, no wonder we are as polarized uh, as we are. How do we get out of it? Well, I'm sure there'll be time tonight to talk about specific solutions. Well, I thank you, Steve, um, for for what you said, and I, I hate to agree with him. I actually like Steve Israel. We get along. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Appreciate uh, you having me and what you're trying to do here. I've done quite a few events at college campuses, and for a conservative, you might wonder, you know, whether I've, you know, got a, some kind of death wish to get, you know, bombarded on college campuses, but. One of the reasons why I do these sorts of things is I really want college kids to see that you can have two partisan people that actually like each other, they get along, we don't agree on some things, of course, but you can actually have fun in having a conversation, disagreeing, and talking about the issues that matter to all of us. Um, so that's number one. Number two, my opinions on why we're so polarized. Um, it's a little depressing, but I think I'm right. Unity is a loser, and division is pure profit. There is no money in unity. There is no book sales in unity. There is no rates on cable networks in unity. There are no clicks in unity. Why don't you think the headlines ever hardly ever match the body of the article? Because the headline is the division, and that's what's being clicked on. So unity is a loser. Division is a winner. I'm not saying I like it. I'm just saying that's my diagnosis. I agree with Steve on the algorithm, which means that the things that you like to click on on Twitter or Instagram, or whatever it is that you look at, all of a sudden become the things that you're coming into your feed, and you're clicking, and you're clicking, and you're clicking, and your position is inflated and inflated and inflated. And Steve doesn't agree with me, but he's clicking and clicking over here, and his position is inflated and inflated and inflated and inflated, and pretty soon everything that he sees is everything that he's thinking about, but magnified, and I'm doing the same. I'm saying, well, you're an idiot, and I can't believe this guy even said this about maybe what's going on in Israel, or maybe what's going on in the speaker's race. And everything we believe is getting magnified. One other layer, the congressional maps. I mean, you all think that we live in the most vitriolic political times in modern politics. Except the safest job in America today is to be an elected congressman. So if it was so horrible and everyone hated each other, nothing works, then why is it that everybody gets reelected? That's because that if Steve and I were best friends, we're friends, but if we were best friends and we lived across the street from each other, let's say San Diego, and we're both in Congress. We have a beer together every night. And we go to each other's houses on the porch and we talk about the day. We agree with each other on nothing. Same media market, same newspaper in San Diego, except my district goes that way and it's 80% Republican. And his district goes that way and it's 80% Democrat. He's not at the chamber meeting on Wednesday. I'm not at the Hispanic Church Festival on Sunday in his district. I'm talking about a double wide electric fence on the border. He's talking about, well, what about the kids that are here through no fault of their own? Should we do something about these kids? And you know what? We've got a better chance of getting reelected than waking up tomorrow. So you add all that together. Everyone loves us. We're saying the opposite thing. We can't lose. The media is amplifying it. Social media is amplifying it. And that's just my opinion on why this, why this sort of feeling that we have, where I think all of us can agree we're sort of just tired of hating each other, but 
it's there. Great overviews, and, and, and thanks for that, those, those senior centers, those perspectives. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I am concerned about, but also it, it's it, in, intriguing in terms of understanding the psychology behind um, the, the, the divide that's out there. I, I, I think we have to try to learn something from um, the fact that uh, with, with Donald Trump, with, with all of um, uh, his problems, the behavior, the indictments, he's still incredibly strong and, I, and, and, and is both troubling, uh, concerning, but you know, we have to kind of look deep into that. And there's a, a disaffected uh, population out there that feels so frustrated and angry that they, as you know, Steve, you've mentioned, I've referred to this before, and, and uh, Rents, I know that you've, uh, Mr. Chairman, you've mentioned this before about uh, it, Trump getting elected to begin with, uh, and the support he has is kind of a big middle finger to the whole system, and people feel disenfranchised. You know, why is that, and how do we fix those problems? Uh, how do we address those things? Well, I mean, it's true. I mean, um, as I said, Donald Trump was the biggest middle finger that the American people could find, and they found it. And by the way, I mean, when you get elected as a middle finger, you get judged through the lens of the middle finger. So when you get judged through the lens of the middle finger, that's why, you know, you wonder, well, you know, there, he says this, he does that, but that's exactly how he got elected, and, and, and it, it really doesn't affect him. Uh, but people are upset. I mean, if you go out in the middle of Wisconsin, you go out in the middle of Michigan, they are upset. They're upset about the border. They're upset about what's happening in the world. They're upset about the economy. They're upset that no one's listening. They're upset about being told what their kids are going to learn in school. They think that the schools have gone bananas in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and, and they're upset about it. So no one's listening. They're being told that they're stupid or they don't understand what you know, equality and equity and this and that and all the other things are all about, and they need to shut, sit down and shut up. And after you're told that over and over and over again, and you've got someone saying, hey, I agree with you. I do think this is insane. I do think that we need to secure the border. I do think that we need to confront China, who's ripping off the world and taking your job out of Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, I do think that these wars overseas are, are, are ridiculous, and we should get out of Afghanistan and get out of Iraq. So when someone is saying something like that, that is jarring, at least from the political sense, that people are not used to the, the, this, this sort of approach. It does, and you, and you can't deny it. I mean, we're a mixed crowd. I'm, I'm sure I'm outnumbered and that's okay, but I'm, I try to talk about it, this stuff in a way that even if you disagree with me, you can understand the perspective. Um, and quite frankly, I think that we're, where the population's heading in that direction again. Now, one other thing before I turn it over to Steve. It's important for you all to remember something that's very obvious, but you need to consider. We don't have a national election in America, okay? We have an election in eight states. I'm gonna talk about this later. But 100,000 people will decide who the next president of the United States is. So this, get the idea out of your mind that the election is some collective opinion of what's good and bad and right and wrong and the right way and the wrong way, because what it's really about is what are these 100,000 people going to do in which party, in which apparatus, is going to outmaneuver the other to make sure that they have more of those 100,000 people in the box than the other person. And we'll talk more about that when you ask us about 2024. Jim, let, let me give uh, our guests a brief tour of, this, of the American electorate, but you're gonna need to put your neck braces on. You're really gonna need to, this can cause whiplash. The American electorate doesn't know what it wants. And I'm going to give you the evidence of that. In 2006, the American electorate decided to give, as you remember, the Democrats uh, and Nancy Pelosi a majority in the House of Representatives 
after Repo a Republican President George W. Bush and a Republican Congress. In 2008, the American electorate said, you know what, we're going to double down and elect Barack Obama. Two years later, the American electorate said, screw Barack Obama, we need a Tea Party Congress to stop him. Two years after that, in 2012, the American electorate said, screw the Tea Party Congress, we need Barack Obama to stop them. In 2014, the American electorate said, screw that Barack Obama, we want to enlarge the Republican majority in the House of Representatives to stop the guy that we just re-elected two years ago. In 2016, the American electorate said, screw all of them, we're going to go with Donald Trump. In 2018, the American electorate said, two years later, said, screw Donald Trump, we want Nancy Pelosi back, <laughs> the Democratic majority, to stop him. In 2020, they doubled down again and said, we want uh, Joe Biden. And in 2022, the American electorate said, we want to keep the Republicans in charge of the House of Representatives to stop Joe Biden. This is a vacillating electorate. This is an electorate that is desperately searching for solutions to the unprecedented array of economic challenges, cultural challenges, the challenges of social media, the challenges of, of that tribalized cable television. This is an electorate that is, continues to shift dramatically from one to the other because it's not sure which, which deal is, is best for them. I think that the, the there's so many people, and maybe the, maybe the vast majority, feel that something just isn't right, that the mm -hmm. system is not working for them. And I think that's the, the, the disaffected part of this, that people are still searching for, uh, you know, how do we fix the, the problems? How do we make people's lives better? And this doesn't seem to be getting that way. It seems to be getting more challenging and, and more stressed uh, every day. Um, I'd like to know, you know, if, if we can maybe talk a little more about the, um, uh, the, you know, the, the inner workings of the, the White House when you were there under... under Tell us how that worked. And, 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 <laughs> you know, how decisions were made. And I'd, I'd love to know, the, you know, the, 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 how the, how the, you know, a day in the life of and, and what it was like there. And I'd, I'd also love to hear your, your best day and, and your worst day uh, in... In, uh, in the job as chief of staff and within the White House. And Steve, I'm going to ask you about your best day and your worst sure. day in politics. All right. As well, um, well um, I would say that my best day was probably my first day, not <laughs> because everything <laughs> went downhill. Uh, no, uh, my best day, I, I, there's a, there were a few good days. Um, I would say that my best day was the first day, um, just because of the, just the, I think the majesty of the White House walking in, and um, we got done with the parade, and I walked in, and I was there with the president, and we were having dinner up in the residence, and he had turned to me and said, do you want to go down to the Oval? And I thought, of course, it'd be great. And I'd, even though I was six years chair of the RNC, I'd never been in the Oval Office because by the time I became any person that would be in the Oval Office, Barack Obama was president and he was never going to have me in the Oval Office. So it was dark and we followed the Secret Service down to the residence. And just so you know, the residence it's a walk, actually, to get through the building and outside the columns and then into the oval. And I remember we walked, it was dark. We were like, where are we, going? Where are we moving to? And we went into the oval. And I'll never forget it because we walked into the oval and it was dead quiet, just like this. And I remember I looked at the president. And he it was the first time I ever saw him like with pressure. Like I saw him overwhelmed. And I remember he looked up, he was looking up at the ceiling. Like that. And I was looking at him. And he looked back at me and he said, Wow, can you believe it? <laughs> I'm like, no, Mr. President, I can't believe it. And but it was a moment because I, I could see, really, it's a rare thing with President Trump, but I could see that he, 
he was thinking, wow, this is going to be, you know, this is heavy stuff. And I remember I walked down to my office, which the chief of staff office is, it's a, it's, it's a big office for the West Wing, but it's not that big as far as offices go. And it's fine, I walked in, and there's a computer, and the only thing in the office is a password to the computer, there's a Bible verse on the desk, and that was it. There's no orientation, there was no, here's what would happen if something happened here, or here's what you do if someone resigns, or here's how it goes. And we had one, I mean, how it really works, and I'm not going to get into all this tonight. I promise you I could entertain you for hours. But it truly is remarkable that you become, you get put in a position like that, and you're, you're running the federal government in an instant. And someone, you know, attorney general resigns because they don't like your travel order. All right, well, what do we do now? Well, let's... Let's look at the Constitution to start, you know? I mean, you really do figure things out quickly. Oh, wait a minute, we need someone who's Senate confirmed. Well, what kind of people are Senate confirmed? Well, U.S. attorneys are Senate confirmed. All right, well, let's think about a U.S. attorney. I mean, you really just, that's the thing about these jobs. It, it's, you can do it too. When you get put in that position, you just start making decisions. Worst day, I would say for sure, for me, was we had, if you remember, there was a time when there were reports of ISIS building bombs on laptops and then taking those laptops to get on, the plan was to get on commercial airliners and put the laptops up on windows at cruise altitude. And there was a time when everyone was very worried about it. Barack Obama was worried about it. We came in a few weeks later and in walked General Mattis, uh, Rex Tillerson, Mike Pompeo, CIA, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and we needed to do something about this problem forming in ISIS. And there was a cell in Yemen that and, and it turns out that a lot of times the conditions aren't right to do something about it. In this particular case, there was a moonless night, and this was the time to go in. And I was in the room working through this issue, and it was the next best time to go in and deal with this problem in Yemen. And so, of course, we agreed. In spite of what it looks like on Twitter and everything else, you have a presidential decision memo signed, drafted by White House counsel, goes in. And then uh, woke up a couple mornings later to a phone call that one Navy SEAL member by the name of Ryan Owens was killed. And about two weeks, I mean, it was horrible uh, news. And two weeks later, I walked into the Oval Office, and I was a little bit disorientated in why, and why there were some people in there. And normally, I was running, I would know exactly what was, who was in there, but for that day, I was running around to different meetings. I ran into the Oval, and I saw this pretty gal with two little kids standing there in a lineup. And it was the night that the president was going to be speaking to the joint session of Congress. And I was looking at this gal, two cute little kids, dressed up really nice. I'm looking and I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is the wife of Ryan Owens who died in Yemen, and they're the two little kids. And it really hit me in that, and I don't mean this in a way that it wasn't, it was gonna happen, everyone and there was an agreement, there was no dispute about this two administrations, but it sort of hit you in a sense like, you know, how easy was it for me to agree, to think, yes, this is a great idea. We, you know, everyone was in agreement. I don't want to make it seem like it wasn't, but you have to understand in that moment, 
and you see those two little kids, and they don't know dad's not coming back because dad's been going back and forth five times. And that was a, it was a tough, tough time because I you know, went into the cabinet room and just that was when it all hit me that these decisions are real. And he's a hero, and they did great, but you know, it, it, all these things have enormous life-lasting consequences, and you know, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing. There, there, there's great cost in that, that those sacrifices that men and women in uniform make. That's a primary example. Steve, how about you? Your best day and worst day in, in office? Worst day uh, began with an email uh, on my Blackberry. Remember, we carried Blackberries around with us before iPhones. Um, I was at the Democratic National Committee. You may have been there as well uh, to have a breakfast with uh, then Senator Joseph Lieberman and uh, got an email from my chief of staff that um, said, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center, likely deliberate, come back. And as I'm reading this, I'm, I, you can hear the beeping of everybody else's Blackberries. And you, you could watch the, the dropping of jaws, the horror, the confusion. Um, my district uh, on Long Island uh, was about 30 miles from ground zero. Um, and uh, I made uh, well over 100 condolence calls. I spent most of the next several weeks attending funerals for constituents. <clears throat> never, never imagined something like that. Human nature and human behavior is an important component of politics that political scientists often overlook. And I don't know about you, Jim, but in those initial hours going to the White House and meeting with the President and the Secretary of State and Defense and the, the uh, uh, Director of National Intelligence, et cetera, I, I just wondered whether I was up to that. Nobody ever told me that you, know, you might be a member of Congress during a massive attack on the United States and you would lose hundreds of constituents. Uh, and I, th those were some tough days because I, I just wasn't sure I, I, I would measure up. Until then, I had been a town councilman in Huntington. My most important meeting was with the highway superintendent to discuss paving of potholes. And now suddenly, with you, we're thrust into these national decision-making scenarios. My best day um, was on Christmas Day, several years later. I'll, I'll summarize this. Uh, and this also, go, for those of you who are interested in studying Congress, this goes to the tools that members of Congress have to make things happen. Uh, there was a young boy named Sebastian Pena. He was five years old. He was in Peru. He had a brain, a, a brain tumor. Uh, his family showed up at the U.S. Embassy in Peru at 3 o'clock on a Friday to try and get an emergency visa. The surgeons at Northwell Hospital were going to donate their time performing life-saving surgery. And the embassy said, well, sorry, we're closed. And by the way, we're closed on Saturday. And I'm sure you've gone through these kinds of situations. We're closed on Saturday. We're closed on Sunday. Monday is Christmas Eve. We're closed. And Tuesday is Christmas Day. We're closed. Come back next Thursday. And the doctors of the hospital called and said, he's not going to make it to next Thursday. Uh, and so uh, I called the, um, the ambassador. Uh, now, maybe you can only get away with this if you are from a state that Chuck Schumer uh, represents. Mm -hmm. I called and I said, hey, Ambassador, just letting you know, um, I'll, I'll be there at four. And he said, beware at four. I said, oh, I'm going to be at the embassy because I'm doing a press conference with this young man who you will not allow in. Uh, to make a long story short, he was allowed in at five o'clock, got his medical, uh, his emergency visa. Uh, he was operated on. He was five years old at the time. The doctor didn't think he'd last a week. Uh, he did die, but he died uh, about three months ago at the age of 19. And uh, so that Christmas day when I, when I saw him uh, in the hospital was the best day I had ever had as a member of the United States mm. Congress. Well, one other thing, I wear this band on my wrist, it says one. And so my mantra to my staff and to any students of politics is if you want to be a member of Congress or an elected official to save the world, get out. You're never going to be able to do it. It's impossible. You'll burn out.
But if you're doing it because you think you can save one life at a time, there's no better profession. My best day was saving that one life. Very good. Great, great story. Great story. And so that's you know the one of the points of this discussion here, with all the you know the the vitriol and the the political divide in the country, I think we all agree that it's still worth it. Uh, mm. It's still it's still worth it. But yet there are so many people that um, right now we see this this um, distrust of government, distrust of institutions. And what are you? What's your advice as to how uh, we fix that? That's one of the things that uh, that. That, that troubles me when I, when I you know, see polls and you talk to people that uh, there's this lack of trust uh, in, in, in institutions and processes. And how do we fix that? Any thoughts? Um, well, I mean, it's a big, broad question. Um, I think you expose the problems. Um, I don't think you... Um, I, I, one thing that I don't think you can do is ignore the fact that there are problems in big institutions in America. There are problems at the VA. There are problems at the DOJ. There are problems at the FBI. It has to be. I mean, because when you have something that huge, there are going to be things that need to be fixed. You're going to have people that are bad apples. I mean, they're, I'm sure this is a great university, but I bet there's a few bad apples here. I mean, so, I mean, come on. I mean, one of the things I think is important is for people who think that Republicans are insane because they don't trust certain aspects of the FBI or DOJ, I think it's important that when you argue with people, you at least acknowledge things that are apparent. The same thing would say to Republicans, that you don't just tear down the FBI and say things that are ridiculous like that. But you try to find the things that are problematic and you work with people to try to address the things that are problematic. Um, but the last thing I would say that since we're on a college campus, because I can't carpet the world and fix everything, and I don't have the answers for everything. But I do know, and what I want to do is encourage the college students that are here. Because one of the things I find out, I told you I go to a lot of colleges and I like to speak to them because I want to encourage college kids to get involved. That I'm finding that a lot of college kids actually love conversations like this. And they like politics and they like policy. and They want to figure out how to think through big problems and come up with big papers to try to resolve them and talk to their professors about these problems. But what I'm also finding, and I'm not, I'm not generalizing, I'm just saying my own experience and opinion, that, that a lot of college kids, they're really turned off by modern politics. They like the issues of what we're talking about, but they don't like the politics of it. In fact, they hate it. And, they want, and a lot of them want nothing to do with it. But I need to encourage you that if you don't like the politics part of politics, to get involved in it, fix it. Go join the college Democrats. Go join the college Republicans or the whatevers. But you've got to get involved because if you don't get involved and the only thing you do is think, you know, three people in our party are nuts or three people in his party are nuts and I want nothing to do with it, then we're just going to let this whole thing keep going. You've got to get involved, and especially if you like politics anyway. I just ask, try to go a couple times to either the Democrats or the Republican meeting and see if you can handle it. If you can, keep going. Steve, what are your thoughts on, on how we fix the, the political divide in the country? And I, I think it's important to understand you know, the, the, the reality, the challenges that we face and, and how we move forward from this period. I, I, I get nervous that if we don't, that it, there, are, there are grave consequences to come. I think we got a, we got a taste of that on, on, on January 6th. Yeah. And you know, we, we, we can't ignore that there's this, this, you know, this big undercurrent out there. And if our institutions of government are not strong, the foundations are not strong, you know, that's the, the seeds of, of revolution. I don't, 
want to see us to go down that road to get that bad. I think you're, you're right. Um, I, I do not fear the collapse of the United States via a foreign attack. I do fear a collapse of the United States via uh, the divisions that we have now. You mentioned the Civil War uh, in, in your uh, in opening comments, uh, reading from Hochschild's book. The Civil War happened and we didn't even have social media at the time. Imagine, imagine how much worse it could have been had there been social media. It would have been irreconcilable. Lincoln would not have had a prick at bringing the, United, the North and the South back together had we had social media uh, at the time. So. Uh, to the extent that I can prescribe solutions, um, I, number one, uh, we need more civic engagement in the country. We need to go back to the business of actually teaching civics. I just saw a statistic uh, that more people can list the three stooges than the three branches of government in America right now. Could you imagine? Um, so I think we have to go back to investing time, raising students. Uh, with a, a more informed uh, basis on, on civics and how government operates. Two, um, I, I get in trouble saying this at college campuses, but like just get, throw this away. Or if you're not going to throw it away, stop getting your news from this because it's not news. As Ryan said, it's bias confirmation. It's algorithmic. It is intended to get your amygdala activated so you will keep your eye on the screen looking at BS. So quit getting news from this thing. Third, uh, I think we need fundamental reform on redistricting, and I'll, and I'll close this question by giving you some data points that illustrates how bad it is. When Jim and I were elected to Congress, there were about 150 moderate centrist districts where crossing the aisle was a value. It was a talking point in campaigns where bipartisanship was rewarded politically by the voters. Uh, when I chaired the DCCC in 2011, because of gerrymandering, the number had been reduced from about 150 to 75. All the other districts got either more conservative or more progressive. Today, the number of truly competitive swing districts, and I define that by uh, 18 districts where you have a Republican member of Congress that <clears throat> voted for Joe Biden, and eight districts where you have a Democratic member of Congress, but the district voted for Donald Trump. That's it, it's less than 30, folks. There are 30 districts out of 435 where bipartisanship, moderation, coming to the center is a political value. The most members of Congress these days do not wake up, most of our former colleagues do not wake up in the morning fearing that they're going to be defeated by the other party. They fear that they're going to be defeated in a primary by somebody further to the left or further to the right. And so what do they do? They pursue those extremes to protect themselves. If we had truly bipartisan redistricting, where districts were drawn based on population and not incumbent protection, you would have more centrist districts. If you had more centrist districts, you would have more compromise, and you would have saner people, quite honestly, uh, in Washington, D.C., who understand that there are times that Reince Priebus and Steve Israel can sit and agree, and if they're going to disagree, figure out how to do it in a constructive way. Couldn't agree, couldn't agree more. So should social media be regulated? Uh, should we take away the protections that uh, that, that the media, uh, social media platforms have uh, to make them more responsible for the content that's on the, that's on the platforms? I believe so, yes. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that the, the actual media itself is hard to regulate, and I think you'd have a lot of constitutional issues with regulating media content. But you're, you're talking about liability but protections. I do think that the delivery of the content is destructive, uh, meaning the algorithms, the, 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 the way that media is delivered. Um, I think it would be very difficult for the federal government to regulate. It could be First Amendment problems with that, but certainly the, the, the way that the media is delivered 
I think is a, is a huge problem in America. It's a problem for parents. It's a problem for kids. Um, you know, for every one message you want to tell your child, they're seeing 50 saying the opposite. And it gets to be very complicated and messy, I think, from beginning to end. I mean, look at the misinformation on, on what's happening in Israel. I mean, half of this stuff, you don't know what's true, what's not true, who did what, who didn't do it, was it even real, was it not? You know, it, it, it gets to be to the point where then people start wondering what's real and what's not, and then people start doubting the real things. And they start questioning what's real and what isn't real. Um, used to be that most people respected what our, you know, if our, if, our, if our Pentagon said something, or if, you know, whether you agreed with the president or not on certain things, when a major issue of global importance was delivered from the president, you believed it. And now I think a lot of people look at it and say, well, that's propaganda. That's, that's something different. You know, we're, that's where the erosion, I think, also comes in that isn't talked about, which is the erosion of love for country, the erosion for respect of a president, whether Republican or Democrat. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with social media and, and what people are watching and following 24 hours a day. Yeah. And, and that's the, one of the reasons why I, I think that some form of regulation is important because it's the algorithms that are driving you know, what you're seeing and it reinforces the <coughs> echo chamber that so often uh, yeah, just, you know, just to clarify, so um, because I think Ryan makes an important distinction, um, I believe that the FCC, I think it's Section 802, you would know, I don't, whatever that section is, that grants social media platforms liabil uh, liability protections, uh, that needs to be rethought. Section that 230. Need, say, thank you, Section yeah. 230. Yeah. Um, that, I believe, needs to be rethought because right now you can scream fire in a crowded movie theater digitally, and it's all fine right now under federal standards. Right. I think that's going to change. And I, yeah. and I, and I agree, you know, uh, you know putting the, the devices down and, and, and engaging more in critical thinking, which is why you know, we rely on our colleges and universities uh, and, and uh, really re reforming and improving our K through 12 system to really foster and encourage and require more. Uh, critical thinking so that people aren't just getting their, the news from one source and, and an echo chamber. L let me ask you this, and this kind of gets into one of the, uh, the, the, the questions from the students that were submitted, pre-submitted, um, and I'll turn to those now that, you know, the vast majority of American electorate uh, exists in the, in the middle. And so, uh, why is American politics so beholden to the extremes, and is the two-party system sustainable for the long term. I find it interesting right now that, uh, that over 70% you know, of the American people or so don't want either President uh, Biden or, or former President Trump as the, as the nominee. And so what are your thoughts on that? And you know, is, the, uh, is, the, is the time right for a a third party candidate uh, to rise. So, do you, you know, let's, let's talk about that. So, there's a bunch of questions, I guess. You know, should President Biden be the nominee? I'll let Steve uh, answer that. And, and should, uh, should President Trump be the nominee uh, with all the troubles and the things that he's doing with be the, the nominee on the Republican side? Well, thanks. <laughs> well, <I hear> <laughs> Yes, President Biden should be the nominee. Uh, full disclosure, I was uh, one of the earliest supporters of President Biden's uh, election in 2020. Uh, Reince and I will have polite disagreements about this. I think under the circumstances, he's done an extraordinary job. Um, I see, uh, I just don't understand for those who say, well, he's too old, I'll leave it to Democrats to litigate for Republicans. That is, leave it to Democrats to be harping on the guy's age instead of to be focusing on his accomplishments. 
Um, and, and so uh, not only do I believe he should be the nominee, but newsflash, he is the nominee. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, there's no undoing that for the, for the foreseeable future, nor should it be undone in my view. That's it. How easy one over That's to you. it. That's, That's as much it. as you're going to get, right? Well, I can go on for hours, but that would be a filibuster. Um, well, look, here, here's the dynamic. Now, you've got to talk Joe about Trump. Joe Biden, now. I'll talk about okay. Trump. Joe Biden is 20 points lower today in approval and likability than he was in 2020. Uh, and he's down across the board. He's down with women, he's down with, with black voters, Hispanic voters, Asian voters, you name it. Because there's, you know, there's two ways to win. You either add votes or you run against someone who's losing votes. A combination of the two, drive the campaign in both sides into the ditch and see what happens. Um, so on the outset, and you don't think my word for it, just read every poll that you can see. And when you've got 70% of Democrats saying they don't want Joe Biden to be the nominee, it's because 70% of Democrats are scared to death that they're gonna put up a candidate that they know is probably the, other than Kamala, the weakest possible candidate that they could put up, and they're scared to death of Donald Trump. And as we sit here today, no doubt about it. If Joe Biden today, things change, okay? I can only talk in today's electorate. Today, Donald Trump will beat Joe Biden, and Donald Trump will be elected 47th president of the United States. And I'll tell you why. It's because, like I said, I was going to tell you, I was going to talk to you about it. 100,000 people will decide this election. 20,000 in Wisconsin. 20,000 in Michigan, 20,000 and maybe 40,000 in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina. And so you understand, you're all, either you're, you're a student or you're, you're a successful person or you're retired and you were, you, had a, you know, you were doing big things. To be really good at things, it's usually being really good at details. Boring, mechanical, details that you've become really good at it. Whether you're a nurse, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a lawyer, there are things that you're really good at. In politics, it's data, voter identification, targeting, and turnout. What that means is, if you all were in Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania right now, I'm not exaggerating. I'd know everything about you. I'd have 10,000 points of consumer data on you. I'd know what beer you drink, what car you drive, how many kids you have, whether your mortgage is upside down or not, the ages of your kids, the color of your truck. And what's crazy about data is that all that data will tell me the propensity you have to support our candidate. And then when we send you an absentee ballot, I know whose door to knock on and whose door not to knock on. And I know that if you're a 90 percenter for the Republican, I'm knocking on your door. And I can see from the clerk's office, because I'm interfaced every day, whether you turn in your ballot or not. And I'm knocking on your door and I'm knocking on your door. My point to you is the feelings that you might have about some of these big issues are going to boil down to a handful of people and how those handful of people feel about where we are in 2024. And I just have to say, um, the issues that are driving the electorate, the people are not motivated to, go to the polls and say, yeah, the economy's doing great. Bidenomics has worked for me. Yeah, I like the idea of, of, of having a, a, a porous border and not being able to find a job in Pennsylvania. These are the things, we, we, you know, we're embroiled in conflicts overseas. Not suggesting it's Biden's fault, but all of these things combined, and you know it, the Democrats know it, their own polls show it. Biden is in trouble, 
and any one of these Republicans can beat him. So, now here's where it gets a little impolite now. Um, <laughs> okay. Look, I, I, first of all, I disagree that if the election were today, uh, that uh, Donald Trump would beat uh, Joe Biden. But more importantly, the election is not today. The election is in a year. Now, I agree with what Reince is saying with respect to analytics, turnout, uh, turnout models, uh, et cetera. But here's the thing. Not only is this an election in seven battleground states, but it's largely an election that moderate independent voters, swing voters, will decide. If you're a Democrat in Pennsylvania, you're just not voting for anybody other than the Democratic nominee. If this is a 42-42 country. 42% of the electorate loves Joe Biden, loathes Donald Trump, or doesn't even love Joe Biden, just loathes Donald Trump. And 42% of the electorate loves Donald Trump uh, and loathes Joe Biden. They're irrelevant. They're irrelevant. It's the 8% that's left. Those are the voters that count. And every analysis that I have ever seen and every data collection that I have ever seen tells me that those voters are by their very nature disengaged not involved, they do not watch him on Fox, they don't watch me on MSNBC, do you know what they watch? They watch their local affiliates because they're worried about traffic and weather. That's what they pay attention to. They know that there's something going on with Hunter Biden and all those politicians are corrupt, so I'm not surprised, but I have other things to worry about. They tend to engage in uh, after Labor Day of elections. That's when they tend to begin to think about, you, you, you saw this yourself with independent voters. Rhode Island has the highest proportion of independent voters of anywhere else in the country, I was just told by Jim Langevin. They tend to engage late, pay attention late. That's when the election is going to be litigated. And in Pennsylvania, and in Ohio, and in other places, when Joe Biden can say, see that chips plant? See those eight, that, that helped create 800,000 new manufacturing jobs, which were hemorrhaging under Donald Trump? Yeah, Bidenomics did that. You see that your paychecks are growing for the first time in recent history? That's what I want to do. Do you see the fact that we're not just melting in the face of uh, aggression against NATO, but we're standing up for those values and rebuilding our alliances to keep you safe? That's what I've done. That when the, if, if Joe Biden, final point on this, if Joe Biden allows this to be a referendum on Joe Biden, he's got, yeah, troubles. But if this becomes a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, I think the choice is pretty easy for those independent and, and I, the, but, but some of the, we don't know what's gonna happen in, I mean, in November, yeah. we know that. Mm -hmm. So, but some of the polls, I mean, should be very concerning for Democrats. I mean, there were polls, I was just looking at one, was why I wasn't being rude, I was actually trying to look at what it said to make sure I was correct, but, that the two polls last week showed the approval rating of Donald Trump actually higher than Joe Biden's. Um, and that there was a couple that they were tied and obviously the polls head to head are all over the place. Um, it's anyone's guess, but the point is, as I would like to say to my Democrat friends in the audience, is that don't be so arrogant to believe that you know, everyone just agrees that we just kind of have Donald Trump. Right now, at least in several polls, Donald Trump is beating Joe Biden. If, if it was such a, you know, you know, the sun rises in the east moment and statement, then you ought not have all these polls that show J Donald Trump beating Joe Biden. I think he will. Uh, and I think the electorates matter today than they were in 2016. More angry today. More upset with government today. Um, and as far as the question about the uh, independent, you know, it's, people talk about it. I think independent candidates, you know, more the merrier. It's just going to hurt Donald or hurt Joe Biden. Um, gives other uh, options, I think, to uh, non-Trump candidate. And when you have more options there, I think it helps Donald Trump quite a bit. I was going to ask you, is the, is, this is the, the, the question, uh, um, you know, you, you kind of answered, I was going to say, who does a third party candidate hurt more? But is the two party system sustainable over the long term? 
Oh, I think it is, and I think it's it's very difficult to undo something like that. I mean, the filing, the filings in all the states, and the way that that political parties work through legislative, uh, you know, the, the way that parties have access to ballots, the way that they have access to um, nomination processes in all the states. Think about the electoral college. You know, how do you how, how the independents got to get to how are they going to get to 270? I mean, they're going to have to win. You know, there are just certain states that are just predisposed to one party or the other. And the independents have very few options left. I'm not saying in 50 or 100 years there isn't some kind of movement. There might be. But I think for the next 10 to 20 years, there won't be much of a, a, a movement away from the two party system. Let me ask you this, um, you know, what is your view over the current divide in the Republican caucus right now uh, in the reference to choose a new speaker in Washington? How does this get resolved? What do you think is going to happen? I think extend the embarrassment and, and a little I, and longer. I, should, I should say, after, you know, Jim Jordan was obviously the most... Uh, yeah, I think the they're delaying the, the vote and, until tomorrow. Yeah, he, voted, um, he lost on the first ballot. He was short by 20 votes. Right. Republican well, I mean, it's embarrassing. It's a joke. It's, it's, it, it's complete nonsense. It, the whole thing is, I think, is awful. But I think the way it gets resolved is just continue to extend the embarrassment until the embarrassment can't be taken anymore by these people. And I think that um, once that happens, they'll, they'll probably either it's going to be Jim Jordan or it's going to be someone like Patrick McHenry from North Carolina and he'll be you know sort of like the guy that helps out and manages and he's very competent knows procedure very well but this is um, this is the horrible uh, embarrassing for the party so We've never seen this happen before uh, at the national level. We did in Rhode Island, uh, by the way, uh, uh, and I was in the General Assembly at the time that uh, we saw for the first time ever. Uh, because usually, you know, you go into your, 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 your caucus, um, you, there will be maybe two candidates running each other for, for speaker. Uh, you take the vote, and whoever the, receives the majority of votes within the, uh, the majority party then it goes out and that's the nominee, everybody falls in line. That didn't happen back uh, a few decades ago and uh, one of the Democratic coalitions were able to join with the Republicans and that person won, John Howard won for Speaker of the House. First time in Rhode Island history, that I, is, is my understanding, uh, that you ever had a kind of a bipartisan coalition uh, win for, for Speaker. Do you think that's a possibility in, uh, in Washington today? What would, what would what would stop it? Why is bipartisanship in a kind of a coalition government so, so hard? No, I don't see it uh, at all. Um, if you are a Republican, uh, you cannot vote for a Democratic speaker. Is that, that's what you're getting at? Can there yes. be a coalition? Yeah. I just find it inconceivable uh, in this climate. I agree with you, by the way. But there are, uh, in fact, I just read a, a, a quick piece on my uh, drive here that several of the Republican House members who voted against Jordan, um, the speculation was they're just going to retire. They can't even run again because their bases will be so furious with them. And by the way, Jim Jordan and his forces have been actively inciting and igniting those bases, putting pressure on them. So I do not see if you're a Republican, and when it's, let's take those 18 Biden districts, uh, 18 districts that Joe Biden won that have a Republican member, you vote for a Democrat, you are A, inviting a primary from somebody further right, B, you are dampening down your own Republican turnout. Nobody's going to be excited to go vote for somebody who turned the House over to a Democrat. Uh, and um, that the combination of, uh, of those things makes it very, very uh, difficult. The Democrats have the same problem. If you're a Democrat, how do you justify voting for a, a Republican and not risk a primary and a deflated uh, base? Uh, so I just don't see any path where you can have a coalition of votes that elect a speaker uh, in the House of Representatives right now.
We touched on this. Good. Do you want to comment? I agree more? with that. Okay. So we touched on this earlier about, about primaries, and I, I want to talk about that. You know, how much have primaries played a role in the polarization of, of politics in the, in the U.S.? And that was one of the questions from the, the students in the audience that I wanted to Yeah, add. well, I'll make it short. I mean, primaries are a huge part of the whole process now because like, if you don't have a lot of districts that are truly in play, then they're really only in play for a primary, whether Democrat or Republican. So getting to the left or getting to the right is usually going to be the name of the game in winning a legislative primary within a legislative district. You know, where you see a little bit, in, in, you see a little bit uh, uh, small difference in statewides, but really not even in statewides because both parties, you know, the values within the parties have shifted and um, the, the idea of, you know, if you're running for governor, uh, you know, in Wisconsin, even though it's a purple state within both parties, you're going to have to check all those boxes. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it is, it's a tough, it's really tough in purple states because you have to check the box in the primary. So you have to be, you know, you have to be the right kind of Democrat and the right kind of Republican, usually, to win a primary, which then pushes the candidates out to the left and the right, and then you have to come back in a purple state and somehow win, you know, a general election after, you know, taking off the other directions for a few months. So, makes it tough. It's no different than running for president. I mean, both, both candidates take off to the left and right, and then they come back usually to try to figure out how they're gonna get some people in the middle on a few issues that are dividing that 100,000 that you need to get to. Steve, any thoughts? I agree, I have nothing to add. I, yeah. I agree with him completely. So there are obviously don't, don't cracks ever, in the foundations. Don't ever say that I've agreed with you completely to <laughs> yeah. anybody. There are, there are cracks in the foundations of, of democracy. Does the country survive this, this time of such political division and, uh, and vitriol and, um, and periods of mistrust? It depends on you. Uh, I'm, I'm fundamentally optimistic, and I'll tell you why. I'm, I'm a, a realistic optimist, um, and I'll tell you why uh, realistic optimism is important. Uh, you, you just can't kid yourself about the state of, of the nation, the state of politics. It's pretty rough, it's pretty grim. Uh, to some it would be hopeless. Um, so uh, I'm not an irrational optimist. Let me tell you why I'm a rational, realistic optimist. I teach uh, at Cornell University. I run their Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. I don't just say this because we're in a university setting. I tell our former colleagues that the best hours of my week, bar none, are when I'm teaching my students. I think that my generation, Reince's generation, Jim's generation, I'm not sure we have the solutions anymore. I'm not sure we can figure it out. I'm not sure we can piece it together. But I am so confident when I listen to my students, when I observe their critical thinking skills, when I witness their intolerance of intolerance, when they say to me, look, you guys have had your chance, move aside, let us do it. We'll do it, thank you and we'll get it right, those are my most optimistic moments. So the answer to your question is, I do not know if we can completely repair democracy and restore unity over the next months or years, but I am fundamentally confident and optimistic that the next generation will be able to do it. And so we just have to hold on <laughs> until that generation elects themselves to Congress, starts volunteering in campaigns more, uh, become congressional staffers, Republican National Committee staffers, DNC staffers. That is what it's going to take. It's going to take your immediate involvement on that trajectory to fully restore and repair democracy in the United States. You will be, they talk about the greatest generation in the 1940s, the next gen greatest generation is just waiting to take over. That's what makes me believe it can be repaired. 
Cameron uh, Davis, yes, agree? I agree with that and really ask the students to get involved. Um, and I, I, you know, like I said, college Republicans, college Democrats, you know, go check it out uh, and get involved and don't be put off by it because if you are, you can help fix it. Um, one of the things I just also want to tell you is that when, speaking of this question about, you know, moving on and, and our future, uh, that when my last day at the White House, which is actually a really funny story, which I won't share tonight. You have to bring me back for this one. But, but the one thing I will share is that I remember, and I was back several times after I left that night, but that was the last time as chief of staff. And by the way, I had a, we had a big party that night too. But so it wasn't a, it wasn't a horrible situation. Um, so, but leaving the White House, I think you know, some of you, most of you probably seen the White House at night when it's glowing and beautiful and it stands for democracy and opportunity and all the values that we believe in as Americans. And when I left that night, although it was a wild day and a wild situation and all the rest of it, I remember looking at the White House and just thinking about the fact that there's nothing on the outside that tells you which president and which party's on the inside. It's that same constant place that stands for those same constant principles that we all believe in that brought us here together tonight. That while we might not agree with each other on some things, there are some things that we can agree on. And one is just that love of country, treating people with respect, having great conversations with each other like we did tonight, to do it for the sake of all of us and the country that we love. Great. Great time. I want to thank you both for a great discussion today. Your comments, your insights, uh, really invaluable. Uh, I thought there was an important dialogue to have. And uh, Steve, you came from Long Island to be here. Uh, and and uh, Chairman Priebus, you came here from Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I give special kudos to Chairman Priebus since he came uh, to a, a, a deep blue state uh, with, deep, uh, with red, red views. Uh, and. Uh, but it was, a, it was an important dialogue to have, both important perspectives to have. We're, we're coming to the close of our program. I'll give you both uh, any last words you'd like to impart. Those were pretty good closing statements. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think we said it all. Themselves, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, well, no, I'll just say one quick thing to the kids. Um, I'm a result, I was a, went to law school. Uh, I worked hard through college and law school but where my career led me, I would have never guessed because I was always a volunteer in the party. I never got paid. I was, the, I was in high school, I loved politics. My parents weren't that political, but I loved it. I loved everything about it. I got involved as president of college Republicans, volunteer, did all these events when I was a lawyer at a big firm in Milwaukee. I was making sure there was enough pizza for people making phone calls. I was. I was the super volunteer, but I loved it and I pursued it. My point to you is pursue the thing that you love. Pursue the thing that gives you great passion and joy. If you're the best trombone player in the world, you're going to make a fortune. But you're also going to have a lot of fun and you're going to have a fun life. If you love politics, pursue it. If you want to be a doctor or lawyer, pursue it. If you want to be an artist, pursue it. You know, you're only competing against a certain amount of people. And everyone else's life goes from A to B too. It's a pretty short time on the line between A and B. And if you love what you do, and you pursue what you do, 
with passion, you're going to rise to the top. And so that's what I want the kids to know because I don't think they're told that enough. And I think it's always sometimes what you think you should be doing as opposed to what you love to be doing. And I think it'll make a big difference in your life. Uh, yeah. I think the best, the best way to end is to ask you to join me in thanking Congressman Jim Langevin for his service to the university and to the state and to the country. Thank you. Thank you for convening us. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great discussion tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was, it, one of my questions was, you know, what is your, uh, that I wanted to get to, that but you answered it without me asking, is what advice do you have to our young people? And it's to get involved. And play trombone, evidently. Play, <laughs> follow your passions. Thank you, everyone. Great discussion. <laughs>